Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, part of the Marine Protected Areas Center webinar series, sponsored by NOAA's National Marine Protected Areas Center and OCTO. I'm Zach Canizzo with NOAA's National Marine Protected Areas Center, and I will be your moderator today. We're very excited for today's webinar titled MPAs as part of the Climate Solution, the Role of Blue Carbon, presented by Sarah Hutto. Sarah Hutto is the Ocean Climate Program Coordinator for Greater Farallon's National Marine Sanctuary, where she integrates climate smart adaptation into sanctuary management and provides training for marine protected areas around the country to undertake climate smart adaptation planning. Sarah's background is in rocky intertidal ecology, and she holds a Master's of Science in Marine Science from Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. We're very excited to have Sarah here today, but before I turn it over to her, I would like to let you know that we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation as they occur to you. Please type your questions into the questions box, which is found at the bottom of your control panel, which is often found on the right-hand side of your screen, and we will pose the questions to Sarah at the end of the presentation. With that, I'll turn things over to our presenter, Sarah Hutto. All right, thank you, Zach. I hope everybody's doing all right today. I'm very excited to be here. I am um, Sarah Hutto, and I coordinate the climate program at Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary as a NOAA affiliate through the Greater Farallons Association. And I want to first thank the sponsors, the, the financial supporters of this work, which includes Greater Farallons Association and Tomberg Family Philanthropies, as well as um, fellow colleagues that have really helped to make all of this happen. And that includes Maria Brown, the superintendent at Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary, as well as my colleagues Sage Tizak and Rietta Homan of Greater Farallons Association. All right, let's get started. So I wanted to start out first by defining how we use the term blue carbon in these reports. And we define blue carbon simply as the carbon that is captured by the world's ocean and coastal ecosystems which includes these coastal blue carbon ecosystems you see pictured here, which you're probably most familiar with, and that includes salt marsh, seagrass, and mangroves. But it also includes what we call marine blue carbon or oceanic blue carbon. And these are processes that are occurring offshore in our marine environment. Um, and they include things like, this isn't a complete list, but some examples, uh, phytoplankton production, um, kelp, and export of that kelp to the deep sea, the movement of mesopelagic fish from surface waters to deeper waters, and uh, whale falls. And um, we know that these are pretty significant processes, and they all result essentially in, in moving carbon from surface waters into deep sea waters. And I kind of envision these processes as like great carbon conveyor belts, um, just capturing, accumulating carbon in the highly productive surface waters of the ocean and moving it to the deep sea where it can remain um, on extremely long time scales. And we know that these offshore sediments are the largest non-fossil pool of organic carbon on the planet. And they can keep that carbon um, from thousands to millions of years if left undisturbed. And to further convince you that marine blue carbon is a really important part of the blue carbon conversation, um, I just wanted to include some, some uh, studies that have tried to kind of quantify that contribution. So for example, global estimates of carbon capture via phytoplankton is around 37 billion metric tons per year. That's equivalent to 40% of global um, CO2 emissions. Um, a recent study by Krauss, Jensen, and Duarte, which I will refer to a couple times during this talk, estimated um, that kelp globally sequester, and that is not just temporarily store, but actually um, export carbon to the deep sea. Um, they estimated about 600 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year is exported via kelp. Another interesting study suggests that uh, fishes are responsible for 16% of the carbon that is exported from the euphotic zone. And then the final one I'll mention is a study by the International Monetary Fund that estimated if we could restore global whale populations to their numbers before whaling um, occurred, then they could sequester 
approximately 1.7 billion metric tons of CO2 per year. So these are really um, significant processes and I'm excited to kind of tell you a little more about the work we've done um, here at Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary. So I have to include this introductory slide just to orient you to where um, I'm coming from. So the Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary is in North Central California. You can see San Francisco on the map, um, on the peninsula there, and just a little bit of San Francisco Bay. Um, and you can see in the, the darker shade of blue where the Fairlands Sanctuary is. And, and we adjoin two other sanctuaries. Um, the Fairlawn Sanctuary is one of 17 protected areas administered by NOAA through the National Marine Sanctuary System. And the sanctuary protects over 3,000 square miles of really, really productive uh, waters. And these waters are so productive because of a process um, termed seasonal upwelling that essentially brings cold nutrient waters to the surface that support a huge array and abundance of marine and coastal life. And at the Fairlawn Sanctuary, we have been um, really interested in the concept of blue carbon for some time now, wanting to better understand what sort of blue carbon um, habitats and processes we protect, um, and maybe what we could do to ensure that we're managing blue carbon um, really effectively. So we embarked on what has so far been a two-year project that has resulted in this two-part series that we published in August and September of this year in the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries Conservation Science Series, and you can find these online. Um, the first one, part one, is was essentially our attempt to kind of wade through um, all of the blue carbon information in the literature and package it in a way that is useful and readable and manageable for people that work in this space. So really our primary audience for these reports are managers of marine protected areas, um, MPA staff, um, folks working across NGOs in marine conservation. And for coastal blue carbon, there is a lot of information, almost overwhelmingly so. Uh, but for marine blue carbon, there's, there's really a lack of information. And so our primary goal with this part one report was to kind of pull all of that together um, review the latest in blue carbon science, discuss how to conduct a blue carbon assessment, and discuss options for um, financing the protection of blue carbon through MPAs. We also have a section that I'll review um, right at the end because I kind of like to leave people with these final thoughts that we call guiding principles. And these are really the messages that we have distilled from this research and are really kind of the, the high level takeaway um, points from, from this work. And then part one also lays a path forward for the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries um, in how these federal MPAs could better understand and better protect their blue carbon resources. Uh, part two, we essentially applied what we learned in part one and then decided, okay, we're gonna actually try to do a blue carbon assessment or also um, we call it a blue carbon inventory for Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary. And so we kind of focused our assessment on the four, the two coastal habitats you see pictured and the two marine processes that you see pictured on these report covers. And in this talk, after a, a bit of introduction, I'm going to review very briefly the methods and results of that assessment. Um, in this report also, we included recommendations for how the Fairlawn Sanctuary could apply that information um, and how it manages these resources. So just a very brief little science lesson before we get into the meat of this. And I created this figure for part one of the report series because I really wanted to be able to compare and contrast how um, at least the photosynthesizers that we assessed, how they differ in um, how they sequester and store carbon long term. So on the right side of the figure, you'll see those coastal blue carbon habitats, um, seagrass and salt marsh. You could also throw mangroves in there. And then on the left side of the figure, we have um, a kelp forest. And these are all photosynthesizers. So they're all capturing carbon through photosynthesis and 
fixing that carbon into their tissues. So at this point in the process, they're kind of doing the similar things here. Um, they're pulling in carbon dioxide, keeping that carbon in their tissues, releasing oxygen as a byproduct. But that's really where the similarities end as far as the fate of that carbon. So if we focus on the coastal um, plants, long-term carbon storage occurs kind of in situ, right in place, where those plants are growing. Um, and this process is really well studied and really well understood. And there's a lot of great information out there on this process and the different factors that impact how much carbon is retained in the system. Um, but essentially when the plants senesce or die, they get trapped kind of right there in the seagrass bed or in the salt marsh system. Um, and because their roots and rhizomes are really stabling that oxygen-free sediment in place, um, it also collects carbon from outside of the system and sediments. And so it, it's building itself and it's retaining carbon in situ in the system. Whereas kelp, um, most kelp is growing on rocky reefs in really wave dynamic environments. And so the process um, that occurs for those coastal plants is really different for kelp. Um, the only way that kelp carbon essentially can be stored long term in most cases is is for it to be removed from the rocks um, when it senesces or is broken apart by predators or um, you know large waves like we've had like 40 foot waves off our coast with this latest storm remove the kelp and a portion of that ends up getting exported offshore and then a portion of that actually sinks to the bottom and that's where long-term carbon storage occurs um, clearly this doesn't happen with all kelp biomass uh, but that cross jensen and duarte study i mentioned earlier they estimated um, with a global model that about 11% of kelp productivity is um, sequestered and stored long-term offshore in these deep sea environments. Now, the other process that I just wanted to touch on a little more closely is that of whales, and that's because we included whale carbon in our assessment. Um, and whales are really amazing because they're essentially, I, I kind of look at them differently now that I've done this assessment. I look at them as these just big carbon storage containers. Um, the estimate is that the average great whale holds about 33 tons of CO2 in its body. So just by way of being extremely massive, they have accumulated so much carbon in their bodies over their lifetimes. Um, and when they die, the vast majority of whales do sink to the deep sea where they actually become really critical foundations of deep sea food webs. Um, but when that carbon gets so deep, and the number I keep hearing from scientists is once that carbon gets below a thousand meters, it, it is effectively um, sequestered and stored on long time scales that are relevant to our climate mitigation discussions. So once that carbon gets down there, it stays down there. So essentially whales are just really efficient carbon movers, carbon packagers and movers and moving that carbon to the deep sea. Um, okay, so that's kind, of, that's kind of it for the introductory material. And I'm gonna move now into the assessment that we conducted at the Farallon Sanctuary. And this was essentially in two components. Um, we have our two, coastal blue carbon systems, and then our two marine blue carbon processes. For the coastal blue carbon systems, we wanted to understand how much carbon is actually in the sediments associated with these plants right now. And so um, that's based on, on taking cores of the sediments and looking at how much carbon is actually in there right now. For all four of these blue carbon um, systems, we also wanted to know how much carbon is being accumulated um, through these processes. So for the eelgrass and the salt marsh, that's essentially, um, we're asking two questions. How much carbon is there now? And then how much carbon are these systems accumulating on an annual basis? And then for kelp and whales, we're essentially just asking one question. How much carbon do these two processes export to the deep sea on an annual basis? So that's essentially what um, our, our overarching goals were for this assessment. And then I'll just briefly touch on how we did this. Um, and again, if you have any questions or wanna learn more, please um, look for part two of this report and you can dig into the methods a little, a little more deeply. So, it's 
a pretty straightforward calculation when you're really only interested in the carbon in the sediments under the under the plants it's pretty easy you really just need spatial data of that habitat so how much acreage of seagrass habitat and how much acreage of salt marsh habitat and mangroves if you have those and are interested um, and you multiply that area by the carbon stock now you can get um, you can do this in essentially a couple minutes because there are global estimates for carbon stock um, associated with each of those three coastal blue carbon systems. Um, and you can find that in, in a Howard et al. 2014 paper. And that's considered like a tier one assessment because you're using global estimates. It's quick, it's easy, it gives you kind of a general sense of the scope and scale, but there is a large margin of error. So we wanted to take the time to try to find some site-specific data. And so that means that, you know, either you yourself go out and you, you have to take cores and analyze how much carbon is in those cores, or if that data is already published, it's just tracking that down. And luckily we had some research partners that had done some extensive work in Tomales Bay and actually all along the California coast, and they could um, supply us with that data. So um, as with most things, it's getting your hands on the data that's tricky and then plugging it in is, is pretty easy. Um, calculating the amount of carbon that's accumulated annually is again, pretty straightforward for these coastal blue carbon systems. Uh, you need the area again, and you multiply that by the annual sequestration rate which is the sediment accumulation rate times the carbon stock, which is the value used in the previous um, calculation. And again, you can get these, there's global estimates for the three coastal blue carbon systems that you can, you can use to just kind of get a quick and dirty estimate. Or if you have site specific data, you can uh, calculate it yourself as long as you have studies that have looked at the sediment accumulation rate in, in the system you're working in. And luckily we did have some master species that had actually looked at sediment accumulation rates uh, for both of these systems. And so we were able to use some site-specific data to get something that is a bit more accurate than using those global averages. Okay, hopefully you're all still with me here because um, this, this uh, the marine carbon accumulation is a bit more complicated with more steps and a bit more uncertainty, of course. So let's focus on kelp. And again, this is just kind of a quick and dirty rundown of methods. Um, we luckily had a couple research partners that are were our kelp experts, along with staff um, that also know quite a bit about kelp and are doing a lot of great mapping work. And so we were able to figure this out. And it was really exciting because no one has done this before for bull kelp to actually estimate carbon sequestration. So these are kind of the basic steps. First, we had to um, basically, you have to know how much kelp you have, right? Um, and so we use satellite imagery to map the kelp extent in the sanctuary, which gives you, you know, like meters squared of kelp. Um, but that doesn't tell you how much biomass is out there, which is what you need to know how much, which is what you need to know to know how much carbon is out there. So we actually developed a, a novel canopy to biomass conversion, which essentially was based on collecting individuals from the water um, at a few sites, and then um, pairing that with drone imagery of those sites and developing a numerical model or a numerical relationship between the, the amount of kelp in the drone imagery and the total kelp biomass from the individuals that were collected. And so using that information, we developed um, a linear model that could then be applied at scale for all of the satellite imagery in the sanctuary boundaries to then estimate the amount of biomass that's out there based on the um, kelp extent. Then we had to do a couple other things to make the information actually ready to use. We had to convert wet biomass to carbon standing stock. We had to add in estimated losses through dissolved organic carbon and particulate organic carbon and this was all um, in consultation with with some research partners and then we could apply the results of that that global kelp model i mentioned earlier from Krauss, jensen and duarte which estimates about 11 percent of kelp primary productivity ends up being um, sequestered in the deep sea 
So a lot of steps there. There's a lot of uncertainty in each of these steps. Um, and so we recognize that this could be greatly improved and we're, we're hoping to improve on the process and the assessment um, in the years to come. And then moving to the whale portion of this, um, there was a fantastic study done in 2010 by Andy Pershing and colleagues where they actually uh, did some really complicated population modeling and they calculated gross carbon flux per individual for a number of whale species. And so essentially all we had to do was get our hands on accurate population estimates for the whales that we wanted to include in the assessment, which isn't necessarily easy, but thanks to NOAA Fisheries, we do have that data. We decided to focus on five um, baleen whales that are abundant in the sanctuary, and we know that they use the sanctuary to feed. And we tried to use the most accurate population sizes possible. Um, but these are highly mobile species and they don't care about our sanctuary boundaries. So for blue whales and gray whales, we had to use pretty large population estimates that cover the entire Eastern North Pacific. But for the other three species, we, we had um, population estimates from NOAA fisheries for just the West Coast of the US. We essentially took those population numbers, multiplied them by the gross carbon flux data from the Pershing paper, um, divided by two to conservatively estimate that only half of the whales that die actually sink. So probably a pretty conservative estimate. Um, but that's essentially how that assessment was done. And I think now we'll move yep, into results. So just briefly to orient you where we actually have, we're circling back now to the coastal blue carbon, where we actually have seagrass and salt marsh in the sanctuary. So um, I'll have just a couple slides here with maps. Really the, the biggest spot for us is Tamales Bay, which you can see in the map of the sanctuary is this really long and skinny embayment. 99% uh, of our mapped eelgrass is in Tamales Bay. And I realize I'm using seagrass and eelgrass pretty interchangeably. We have in the sanctuary eelgrass, which is in protected embayments and is the type of seagrass that is doing the sequestering of carbon. And we have surf grass, which grows um, in tiny little fringing pockets along the coast, um, but in pretty wave dynamic systems. So it's kind of a, a whole nother beast and we did not include surf grass in this assessment. So this is eelgrass. Um, so there's Tomales Bay. You can see the eelgrass in the light green. The salt marsh is also mapped here in kind of the olive dark green. And then we also have these coastal blue carbon habitats in two Asteros, Astero Americano and Astero de San Antonio, as well as Bellinas Lagoon. And that's pretty much it for the sanctuary. We don't have, you know, vast salt marshes like San Francisco Bay. Um, so now the results. And so for each of these, I have this infographic and I'll, I'll walk us through it the first time. And then the second time, maybe it'll make a little more sense. Um, so this is the map salt marsh in the sanctuary. And we have over three and a half square kilometers of salt marsh in the Farallon Sanctuary. And within the sediments associated with salt marsh, um, we estimated we have about 99,000 megagrams of carbon that is currently stored in those sediments. If, and, and that's to a meter depth. If those sediments were all disturbed, that carbon was released, it would, it's the equivalent amount of carbon that is released by almost 80,000 passenger vehicles driving throughout an entire year. It's also the equivalent amount of carbon um, that would be released if you burned 41 million gallons of gasoline just to give you a sense of what 99,000 megagrams of carbon even means. That's kind of what it means. For annual accumulation, this is the amount of carbon that's being accumulated within the salt marsh every year. We estimated that to be almost 700 megagrams of carbon. And that is equivalent to um, about 553 passenger vehicles driving every year. It's also equivalent to about a quarter million gallons of gasoline being burned. And then using what's called the social cost of carbon, this is a metric that is developed by an interagency working group of the federal administration. And um, it essentially describes the dollar value and economic harm that is done to society by the release of one metric ton of CO2. So right now, 
the social cost of carbon is $51 per metric ton of CO2, but it's being revised and it will probably be increased. Uh, but using that metric, we can estimate that salt marsh in the sanctuary provides about $130,000 in societal benefits every year through the service of removing carbon dioxide from the air. Okay, so moving on to seagrass, and again, it's really the same infographic, but different numbers. We have over seven square kilometers of seagrass in the sanctuary, and the sediments um, underlying that seagrass stores about 75,000 megagrams of carbon, which is equivalent to the emissions of 60,000 passenger vehicles driving for a year, or also equivalent to the emissions um, resulting from burning 31 million gallons of gasoline. Uh, yeah. And then annual accumulation of carbon within seagrass. You'll see it's quite a big range between 91 and 743 megagrams of carbon, um, which was really annoying to have to deal with. And that's based on the range of sediment accumulation rates that we had available to us. So I would love if we could kind of refine this in the future. Um, but our research partner really felt it probably accurately represents the high variability that seagrass beds experience due to temporal changes in runoff, storm-driven sediment deposition or loss, and tidal flows. So don't worry about it, <laughs> is basically kind of how we, how we felt about this, this big range, um, as kind of annoying as it is. So taking the upper end, because I really wanted to know, like, what's the maximum potential? Um, the upper end of the amount of carbon that's annually accumulated is equivalent to about 600 passenger vehicles driving every year, driving for a year, um, or burning 219,000 gallons of gasoline each year. And then again, using the upper end of that estimation, the social cost of carbon um, means that seagrasses provide up to $139,000 in societal benefits every year. Okay, I hope you guys are still with me. Um, before I get into the kelp data, kelp kind of has this really interesting story. You might be aware that along the California coast, we have experienced really, really significant drastic decline of our kelp forest. In some areas, upwards of 90 to 95% of kelp have been lost due to a confluence of environmental factors. Um, if you want to learn more, you can go to our website at fairlawns.org. We have a whole, a whole thing on there about kelp loss. Um, but this, this interesting animation just shows um, aerial survey data from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. You can see in that pink magenta color, that was kelp coverage in 2008. And then in the yellow color, that is the amount of kelp we had in 2016. To visualize this in another way, we essentially went from really healthy, productive kelp forests to bare rock with a whole lot of urchins. Um, and so because of that, we wanted to do this assessment to capture that change. And so we actually assessed um, the amount of carbon sequestered by kelp prior to the big kelp collapse in 2008. And then we assessed it after the big kelp collapse using 2019 data. And so in this infographic, you'll see on the left side is 2008 data, on the right side is 2019 data, before and after our big loss of kelp beds on our coast. So you'll, be, you'll see the extent, um, and this is using satellite imagery. So it isn't entirely accurate for really patchy kelp forests. So it might be an underestimate for 2019, but essentially we went from two and a half million meters squared down to 6,000 meters squared of kelp and the corresponding change in how much carbon was stored in that kelp forest from over 5,000 megagrams um, to just, I think that says 18, I can't remember because my little um, control panel is covering the number, but you guys can see it. And 11% um, of that after doing those, those modifications to the data that I went through, the amount of carbon that's actually exported offshore and, and accumulated in the deep sea 613 megagrams in 2008, down to just 1.8 in 2019. And then you can see the equivalents as far as passenger vehicles, and then again, using the social cost of carbon, um, the value to society of those carbon sequestration services. 
So, um, you know, we already know that kelp supports fisheries, kelp supports insane biodiversity along our coast. Um, but here's yet another reason why we need to really make sure we're doing everything we can to protect the kelp we have and try to bring back our kelp forests to their, their former glory because they also are providing a carbon sequestration service. Okay, on to whales. Um, you'll see the five whales that we included in this assessment. And just to remind you, the blue whales and the gray whales, we had to use kind of much larger population estimates for the entire um, Eastern North Pacific. And for the other three species, it's for the West Coast of the US. Uh, but these, these are the estimates of how much carbon is being exported per year for each species. And then taken together, it's almost 3,000 megagrams of carbon um, exported to the deep sea each year, which is equivalent to over 2,000 passenger vehicles driving or equivalent to burning a million gallons of gasoline each year. And then using the social cost of carbon, whale falls in the sanctuary provide over half a million dollars in societal benefits every year. Okay, so then taken all together, just I have a couple summary slides of the data. Um, the amount of carbon that's currently stored in our coastal blue carbon sediments together are equivalent to 642,000 metric tons of CO2 or um, 140,000 vehicles um, driving for a year. And then looking across the four processes that are accumulating carbon on an annual basis taken all together, it's about 5,000 megagrams of carbon per year, which is equivalent to 18,000 metric tons of CO2, which is equivalent to about a million dollars in societal benefits annually using that social cost of carbon metric. And then another interesting metric I wanted to point out is we do annual emissions inventories at our sanctuary. So looking at what is our carbon footprint essentially through keeping the lights on, um, running our computers, driving to the office, running our research vessels. And using data prior to COVID, because the pandemic has totally screwed that up, um, the amount of carbon that's uh, accumulated, sequestered each year is 140 times the amount of CO2 emitted from annual site operations um, using 2019 data. So pretty significant. And then just to visualize those four components of annual carbon accumulation, in another way, whales accounted for 60% um, of that annual carbon accumulation. And then the other three, um, basically the three photosynthesizers accounted for about equal parts of the remaining 40%, with a number of caveats being that whales, we use much larger population numbers than what would be restricted to the sanctuary. Eelgrass being that, that number is on the high end. And then bull kelp, that number is um, what those kelp forests were doing prior to the significant kelp collapse. We wanted to understand really the potential, not necessarily what they're doing right now, because the kelp still has not um, really returned to those 2008 levels. Okay, so shifting now to a couple kind of conclusion summary slides. Um, first, I wanted to touch on pretty much like what, what we learned from doing this assessment and what we are now focusing on. So the first is that we have learned from this assessment that our blue carbon habitats and processes are really significant and we need to continue to ensure that there is adequate protection in place. And so that includes things like uh, preventing loss of blue carbon habitats like salt marsh via erosion, um, that includes things like protecting our blue whale populations, not just blue whale, but our whale populations from the leading cause of mortality, which is ship strikes and entanglements. Because um, if we can rebuild those whale populations, they can sequester even more carbon. We're also collaborating internationally on a number of fronts um, and engaging internationally. We're learning from other countries that are doing really fantastic things. Um, and we're also working together to raise awareness. This is a, a big goal of these reports is just so that people realize how important MPAs are to the uh, climate mitigation discussion because they are major carbon sinks 
and we need to protect them with that in mind. So raising awareness of MPAs as a part of the climate solution. Um, NOAA is a part of this international partnership on MPAs, biodiversity, and climate change. And the partnership will be presenting a session at the Climate Talks in Glasgow next week. I think it's next week or a couple weeks. Um, and also NOAA's MPA Center is working with the State Department to help other countries include blue carbon into their carbon accounting. So um, reaching beyond our federal MPA and really working internationally, I think is critical to drive this conversation forward. And then for the Farallon Sanctuary, we're really interested after this assessment in better understanding our marine sediments. Um, how much carbon is out there? And are we doing enough to protect those marine sediments from damage and from disturbance? Um, we're also interested in kind of the, the, all that bare mudflat sediment in our estuaries that doesn't have seagrass or salt marsh associated with it, so it wasn't included in this assessment. Uh, local researchers have indicated they um, have nearly as much carbon as those seagrass and salt marsh sediments do. So better understanding really sediments in general, um, how the carbon gets there and how we can protect it once it's there is, is a big area of focus. And then my last slide, I promise, um, I wanted to leave you with these final thoughts, as I mentioned at the very beginning. These are highlighted in a section of the part one report called Guiding Principles for MPA Managers. And these are kind of our big takeaways. Um, and so we wanna communicate these as much as we can. The first bodes really well for marine protected areas. And that is that in the literature, time and time again, I came across studies that showed when we manage for the whole ecosystem, we are managing really effectively for blue carbon because ecosystem-based management targets preserving or restoring food web dynamics and ensuring that ecosystems are functioning and those predator-prey interactions are actually really critical um, for blue carbon. The next is that blue carbon should be considered an MPA designation and management and I think this is a really exciting thought and it's something I've learned a lot from the government of Scotland actually they've been using blue carbon as a metric for designating further MPAs in there in, in the UK waters um, and I think it's a really critical piece of how we manage our marine areas is that we take into account um, carbon sequestration that might be occurring uh, the next one is that managers should understand how to leverage blue carbon to finance MPAs None of us are, well, very few of us are economists and very few of us are very comfortable with this subject matter. So I tried to approach it in part one of this paper, even though I'm not comfortable with um, kind of the economic side of things. But I think it is really critical that we understand how uh, blue carbon can be leveraged to finance protections. And that's not just through carbon markets, but that's through blue bonds or mitigation banking, some processes that <clears throat> MPAs are already using, but using them specifically for blue carbon. Um, the next, and I hope I've gotten this one across so I won't bemoan the point, is that blue carbon management is not just coastal, but especially for MPAs to have a seat at the table. And I think to be relevant for climate mitigation discussions, we've got to push um, the marine blue carbon component of this. And then finally, Certain management actions can produce greater sequestration gains. For example, I found in the literature many times that protecting the carbon stores we already have is actually a much more effective management strategy than trying to restore um, carbon habitats that have been damaged. Restoration is critical and should always be a component of marine resource management, but I think it's important to understand that protection specifically is really critical for blue carbon and that we need to protect uh, what we already have from being disturbed. So with that, I think we have some time for questions and I by no means am a blue carbon expert, but I can at least speak to our experience at, at the Farallon Sanctuary. Um, and even beyond today, I would love for you to reach out and get in touch. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you have questions, and then there's our website for more information. Uh, but thank you, everyone, for being here and making it through to the end.
Thank you, Sarah. So we do have a number of questions that have already come in, but if you have a question for Sarah, please put it in the question box, which is on your control panel, which I know that a lot of you have found already. Um, we may not get to all of the questions, but we will get to as many as we can, and the questions will be provided to Sarah at the end of the webinar to follow up uh, on questions that she is able to. So the first question we have is, is there a good estimate of the amount of kelp buried offshore versus washing up onshore? For in South Oregon, for example, they end up with piles of kelp on the beaches during winter following winter storms. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we get tons of beach rack and the kelp that comes up on our beaches is important in its own way um, because it's, it's a subsidy to the beaches and it provides that material for for beach ecosystems as well. But as far as how much, you know, biomass ends up offshore versus on the beach, really the only the only study that I know of that we can really go off of is this Krauss Jensen Duarte modeling effort. Um, where they looked at the fate of the primary productivity. And they, they broke it down beyond that 11% number that you heard me talk about. They broke it down to like a certain percentage kind of stays in the subtitle area, a certain percentage gets actually in the deep sea sediments, a certain percentage just gets below a thousand meters. I don't think they included uh, beach rack in, in that because they were looking at just kind of what was being sequestered. Um, and I imagine there might be some site-specific studies on how much kelp ends up on the beach. And it is actually something that our kelp, um, kelp recovery coordinator here at the sanctuary is really interested in looking into. So I think it's an easier, it's an easier thing to answer how much kelp ends up on the beaches. That's an easier thing to answer because you can actually go to the beaches and, and do regular collections and measurements. I think it's still trickier to figure out how much ends up getting sequestered eventually in the deep sea. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question related to the deep sea sediments actually, asking if this work on sediments implies that bottom trawling has a more negative effect on climate change than commonly thought. If so, could we include stopping bottom trawling as a blue carbon gain? And I know that there has have recently been a paper or two that have come out in the literature about this. So if you could speak to that. Yeah, there's that really good one. I wish I could remember the author. Zach, if you can um, remember who it is while I talk, it would be great to let people know because it was a really groundbreaking global study <clears throat> that looked at the impact of trawling on, on uh, carbon remineralization in the deep sea. The study indicates that trawling does have a pretty big impact in disturbing those sediments and releasing that carbon back into the water column. I think what's not entirely clear is when that when those sediments are disturbed, can that carbon that's remineralized actually make it up into surface waters and back into the atmosphere? That I don't think that pathway is very well understood, but this study that I hope Zach can track down for me did really um, I think provide a lot of evidence that trawling and any really any bottom disturbance does remineralize that carbon that was locked away. Um, so it's it's an interesting question, um, and something that I know our sanctuary managers are interested in learning more about. And we are actually looking to kind of do a part three report to this series focusing um, on our offshore sanctuary at Cordell Bank and some offshore areas within Fairlawns to try to estimate based on um, the amount of trawling that takes place, what, that, what degree that disturbance might be occurring. Were you able to find it, Zach? Yes, but uh, it's Sorry. Sala et al, 2021. Yes, that one, okay, nature. Sala et al. Um, so I will post a link to that in the chat. Uh, I will say it is behind a paywall for those who do not have, um, don't have access to the article Nature. So I apologize for that. But that that paper has definitely been getting some attention as of late. Well, and even um, if you can't access the paper, there's like a million media articles on it. So you can find what, what you want to get. Yeah. Very true. Another question we have is, how has carbon finance been leveraged to help restoration or management efforts? Um, yeah, so 
Zach, you could probably even help answer this. Um, the projects that come to mind are often focused on mangroves, where they've been able to, to leverage carbon markets to raise funds to support uh, restoring mangroves. And there's one project that's on the tip of my tongue, the Tahiri, Tahiri Moko project. I think it was profiled in one of the MPA newsletters. Um, so it's it's been done. The, the problem um, or the, the issue we're running into, especially in the context of the Farallon Sanctuary, is that for a, a restoration project to be viable and eligible on the carbon market, it has to be of a certain size because you have to demonstrate um, you know, a significant amount of sequestration potential. So that's a challenge. We don't have we don't have vast um, salt marshes, and and right now it's really only in the U.S. It's really only relevant for salt marshes. We don't have vast salt marshes in our sanctuaries, um, at least not in Fairlands. And then the other difficulty is you have to prove additionality. You have to prove that without these carbon market funds, um, this this added uh, sequestration benefit would not be able to occur. Um, so the concept of additionality and the concept of needing a vast enough area to be the focus of restoration pretty much makes carbon markets not viable at all um, for the vast majority of marine protected areas that might be interested. But I'm hoping that will change. I'm hoping we that market methodology could be developed beyond just salt marshes because I feel strongly that really MPA's biggest value in the whole carbon sequestration realm are these marine processes. And if there's any way that we could include those, those in the market, then that would probably be the way to go. But that's, that's a long way off. And that's way beyond my understanding of how carbon markets work also. Um, it's a steep learning curve for me, but that's, that's kind of my best answer to that question. Thanks. We do have a question wondering whether or not the carbon data for the Farallons has been inputted into the Smithsonian's Coastal Carbon Atlas. No, but I'll look into that. Thank you. Great. And then uh, two questions that are somewhat interrelated. So the first asks, with respect to kelp forest loss and kelp forest and sea urchin beds are two different types of steady state ecosystems. If you, to re you were to remove the urchins, wouldn't the kelp forests return? And as you are thinking about that, an interrelated question related to restoration, asking, could you talk more about restoration and how long it might take to restore those systems to the point where they may function as well as existing healthy ecosystems? Right, yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll tackle the first one first. Um, and yes, healthy kelp forest and urchin barren, they are like two steady states where it takes energy to, to push them from one steady state to the other. It's like this hump of energy. Um, yes, we could go out and remove lots of urchins and they are doing that through some pilot projects um, outside of the sanctuary and um, I believe a couple locations within the sanctuary. So removing urchins, that is kind of the probably the best available option. It takes a lot of person power, it takes a lot of, of energy, and a lot of the North Coast is really um, not super accessible to get people out there and in the water. Um, and then there's the question of um, the money it takes to do that. And if the urchins were marketable, that would be one thing, but they're all starved. They're just hanging out down there, starved, waiting for food, um, which they can do for quite a long time from my understanding. So they, their gonads are so undeveloped that they're not marketable. So there's, not, there's no profit in pulling them out of the ocean. Um, so it's really a, a question of, scale and uh, resources to get it done. Uh, but yes, that's the general thinking is, you know, a, a disease, disease might come through to wipe the urchins out or a big storm might come to move the urchins off of a denuded barren and then the kelp could come back. The problem is that this first started occurring in 2014 and it's 2021. So we are a little concerned that the kelp 
spores that usually can hang out until they're able to grow and to help adults that they aren't out there anymore. We don't know how long they can survive. And so even if the urchins were removed, will we need to do more? Will we need to seed with spores or outplant individuals? So there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, we've seen a little bit of recovery this year, but nothing to the scale of what we need. So there's a lot of ongoing research to be, essentially answer your question. And then the second part was um, like how, something about how restored do systems need to be. That's, there's a lot of work in the coastal blue carbon space on that, that I'm not, I'm not really familiar with. Um, looking at when you restore a tidal marsh, how long does it take for that tidal marsh to start providing those carbon sequestration benefits? Um, and I think it's probably a very complicated answer. As far as kelp, kelp is so much more of a straightforward process. You just want it to be out there and growing. And then by being out there and growing, a certain percentage is going to end up in the deep sea. So it's uh, kind of more of a, co a direct correlation, whereas I think it's a bit more complicated for those coastal blue carbon habitats. Great, thank you. We also have a question related to sharks and their role in the carbon cycle. So similar to whales, the person notes that sh that what some sharks, particularly white sharks, are rather large and can be long lived. So they're wondering if there is has been any research or any data on their potential role in carbon sequestration and storage. Not that I know of, um, but there's a big movement out of Norway and there's papers and websites and you could just um, search for fish carbon where they essentially take this concept of, of whales and apply it to really all marine vertebrates um, because essentially they are all you know carbon packages some bigger than others uh, but if you've got a lot of abundance then that can be a really significant component so there is i think there's some some information out there that is more focused on fish and other large uh, marine vertebrates, but there's this is such a young field when it comes to um, in, even considering these as part of the blue carbon discussion that there's not a ton of information. Typically what you see with fish is there's a lot of focus on mesopelagic fish and that being because they feed at the surface and then they inhabit um, greater depths. And so they die and they defecate at greater depths. And so they are have, have been the focus of a lot of work to show this surface to depth carbon movement because of how they live. Um, so that's where I've seen most of the, the fish specific studies. But sharks are certainly a part of that. And, and so are, um, you know, many other marine vertebrates. It's just kind of easier to focus on whales because they're so big and we have we have population numbers for them. So that's the other thing. It's hard to know how many um, the numbers of these other vertebrate species out there. Thank you. We have a question asking if you or the sanctuary are developing or implementing any policy or legal tools for blue carbon protection in the sanctuary that you might be aware of. Uh, it's a hard question for me to answer, um, but I know that our sanctuary superintendent, Maria Brown, is really interested in um, incorporating blue carbon considerations into a lot of how the sanctuary is managed. We are looking at things like um, permitting. So when we issue permits, can we include um, consideration of, of impact to any sort of blue carbon sequestration processes when we're issuing those permits, for example? Um, and as I mentioned, we are looking <clears throat> into how can we consider blue carbon when we're looking to designate new sanctuaries or expand sanctuaries um, and also um, within a sanctuary's management plans. So basically the, the management actions that a sanctuary decides to take, can we um, include blue carbon in the discussion of, of which actions to take um, kind of regardless of, of the subject area? but to kind of consider blue carbon like a lens when we're making these management decisions. And if there's any um, other sanctuary staff on the line, I am definitely open to other people chiming in. So make yourself known. 
Great, thank you. Uh, we do have a question wondering if the blue carbon storage and process, the blue carbon stores and sequestration processes at Greater Farallons are resilient to climate change. Some ways that they could be that they note are things like upward migration pathways for wetlands to respond to increased sea level rise. So if you could take a minute and talk to the resilience, uh, resilience to climate change of the processes you talked about, that would be great. Definitely, that's such a great question um, because it's one thing to kind of understand how the processes are working now, but it's a totally different thing when we're trying to figure out um, how we manage for unavoidable changes. And so we have, we're actually updating it this next year, but we did conduct a climate vulnerability assessment back in 2014, and, and we did focus on eelgrass and salt marsh as a part of that assessment. Um, we did also include <clears throat> large whales in that assessment, and we included kelp. So really every component of our blue carbon assessment, we looked at through a climate vulnerability lens. Um, we need to update that now because I think we've learned a lot in the last seven years. Um, I'll take them piece by piece. We know kelp is highly vulnerable to these warm water events and kind of cascading ecological consequences of that. And back in 2014, we didn't really um, we didn't really think that kelp would, would we thought kelp would be super resilient. You know, it 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 uh, goes away, it comes back, and and maybe maybe it will. Maybe this is just a really long cycle of it uh, being extremely low abundance. Um, but we know that kelp, it can only it can only do so well when we keep getting hit by these marine heat waves. So that is that's an important consideration. Um, we know whales are highly vulnerable, mostly because their food responds to oceanographic conditions, and they're highly vulnerable to um, uh, non-climate stressors like ship strikes and entanglements, which we're trying to actively manage in the sanctuary. A lot of our climate work is focusing on what we can control, which isn't necessarily directly climate related, but easing other pressures so that species can be resilient to those climate impacts. And then as the, the person mentioned, um, our coastal blue carbon habitats, so salt marsh and seagrass, um, yeah, they're they're getting like the double whammy from the land side, human development, um, and then from the ocean side, sea level rise and erosion is really the the biggest threat to blue carbon coastal blue carbon systems that I found in um, my studies is that erosion is a huge threat. It causes the release of massive amounts of carbon dioxide. Um, and especially if these habitats can't migrate quickly enough to respond to sea level rise and erosion, and if they can't migrate at all because there's a road there, um, then it's a big problem. So these are all long-winded answers, I'm sorry, but at the sanctuary, we have a number of projects where we're trying to make it easier for these habitats to adapt. So with eelgrass, we have a mooring removal program in Tomales Bay to remove these derelict moorings that are impacting seagrass beds. Um, for salt marsh, we have a project in Bolinas Lagoon where we're just kicking off this year, the scoping for, um, where we're looking to, to kind of build up a living shoreline on this highly eroded shoreline in Bolinas Lagoon where the tidal marsh is essentially, it goes from mudflat to high marsh. All that transition zone is essentially missing. We wanna grade that and, and um, kind of restore a functioning marsh there. This is only, of course, a short-term solution. We know a certain amount of sea level rise is baked in, even if we limited all of our emissions today. So it's going to be a constant iteration as we go, um, trying to stay ahead of the climate impact curve, but it's pretty tricky to do. Um, and there's going to be some hard decisions for municipalities um, and for counties to make for their, for their human communities as we on the sanctuary side are trying to protect our biological communities and ecological communities. So um, it's complicated and I could keep going, but I'll just, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are pretty much out of time. Um, so I apologize to those whose questions we were not able to get to, but I want to take a moment to thank you all for listening and for submitting such insightful questions and to Sarah Hutto for both presenting and for taking the time to answer your questions. So thank you, Sarah, and thank you all for attending. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it.